our next speaker that needs no introduction, <laughs> Stephen Bates, the chief consultant at Rathlin. Uh, he works extensively on storage architecture, non-volatile and persistent memory, and the intersection between performance barriers, performance hardware, and performance software. He has been involved in the architecture and development of both RAID-based and flash controllers. He has intimate knowledge of the most common networking and storage protocols, including NVM Express, SAS, SATA, PCI, Ethernet, and RDMA. He has worked on a variety of CPU architectures and is active in the development of the Linux kernel. Please welcome Stephen Bates. Hi, everybody. Hello, everybody. Uh, sure, I'll try and use this. It's on. I don't know about singing in this one. We'll see. No singing? No singing? <laughs> Just for you. La, la. There we go. So my name isn't actually Stephen Bates. I'm Adan Burstein from Mellanox. You can tell by the braces. Believe it or not, I lost a bet in a bar last night, and I have to wear these. They are actually Adan's braces. <laughs> I kid you not. Um, so thanks a lot for coming, everyone. I'm going to talk about the um, things that some people have been doing in the Linux kernel to support low latency block devices. And I'm going to talk a little about low latency block devices and some performance data and why this is a good thing for everybody um, and kind of give you an update on what's going on there. The person with the, speak, the time limits, where are you? Can you wave? Perfect. So last year, I was terrible. I ran overtime. Mark had to like literally punch me to get me to stop talking. Yeah. So I want to make sure I don't take too long and we get a bit of time to have a chat about it. And I also want to start by saying thank you, Martin, for his excellent talk yesterday. If you missed it, you did miss out. It was a very good kind of broad overview of what's been going on at the block layer of the Linux kernel. Uh, if you missed it, I suggest you get the slides. And if it was video, maybe watch the video. Very, very good. Thank you, Martin, because it was a great introduction to this section. So um, just as a reminder, uh, I have this word called blucky. It's not my word. It's my son's word. He made it up. It's, it's blah and yucky combined. So he uses that a lot. And I just want to start by saying, personally, I think low latency block devices are not blucky. And uh, on a couple of recent LinkedIn posts, I've been talking about some of this. And some people have been jumping back and, and, and saying, we've got to go byte addressable. Uh, other people are like, well, you know, we're maybe not quite ready for byte addressability. I see persistent memory, which I'm a big fan of and low latency block being very complementary to each other. They can work together. Uh, they can solve different problems, or they could solve the same problems. So I think we are definitely very excited around persistent memory and what its BICE addressability capabilities can bring. But there are still challenges that have to be addressed. Uh, and in the interim, uh, at the same time, we're getting some pretty interesting new types of NVMe devices. And NVMe is a block protocol. Uh, with really low latency, and we'd like to be able to take advantage of those. Uh, and I'll talk about that through the talk. And you also got to see a picture of my kids. Really cute. Um, another reminder, what is a block device? In, in Linux, a block device is just a file, like any other file in, the, um, you know, in, in, your, in your file space, in your namespace. So we have things like slash dev, right? That's the device tree. Uh, and if you do an ls on a slash dev, it will tell you, is it a character device, or is it a block device, or is it a directory to another level of devices? And, and if you do a, an ls minus l on a block device, it starts with a b, and that tells you it's a block device. And you know that you can talk to it using block device semantics. So I can open it, I can read it, I can write it, I can seek it, and do all those things. Now, what happens underneath depends on what the block device is backed by. And in the Linux kernel, we have all kinds of things. We've got crazy things. We have null blocks. So this is a, essentially a test block device that Jens wrote. And we use it all the time because it, it doesn't do anything. When I write to it, it says, I got your data. It does not have your data. It's throw, <laughs> it totally disregarded it. But it gives you a response. And when you read back, you get zeros. Or like me, I hacked it. And it gives me like, it gives me like Stephen Bates is awesome over and over again in every LVM. <laughs> Right? You, can, you do that. It's great for testing, but it's not going to store any data, uh, but it's good for testing. We have PMEM devices now. PMEMs are block devices, and there was a really good talk yesterday from Intel on DAX 
versus you know libm. We have a lot of different ways right now of talking to things like an NVDIM N or other types of persistent memory. But one of them is a block device mechanism where they've taken all those physical ranges of NVDIM memory and they've put a block kind of interface and software above it. And then they've presented that out as a block device. You can put file systems on it. If you don't put a DAX enabled file system on it, that file system could go very, very badly wrong for you, but you can do it. And it might work until power loss occurs and bad things happen, right? So it's backed by persistent memory. We have the lovely, wonderful slash dev slash NVMe 0N1. I love this one. All right, this is an NVMe device. It's an NVMe namespace. You might have multiple namespaces on the same device. You might have multiple devices. Uh, those devices are typically NVMe solid state drives. And today, they're typically backed by NAND. But I'm going to show you some examples that are not backed by NAND. So if they're backed by not NAND, then they're backed by AND, right? Boolean joke of the day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like that joke. Um, and of course, that device is talked to through the NVMe protocol. Um, interestingly, that NVMe protocol initially was only PCIe, right? Direct attach. But now that NVMe 0N1 that could be a Fabrics NVMe block device. And rather than talking to a local NVMe drive, I may be talking to Fiber Channel or RDMA and soon coming TCP IP to go across a network to talk to a target that may or may not have NVMe drives in it. And that's the beauty of NVMe over Fabrics. That's the, the dirty secret of NVMe over Fabrics in the Linux driver is you don't actually have to have a single real NVMe drive in NVMe over Fabrics. It could be a null. It could be a null. It is a null block device. In my, <laughs> most of my testing it is, because I can't afford to buy NVMe drives. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have, no, I have, that's why I had to form a company to build my own, because <laughs> I couldn't be bothered buying them. Um, SDA1, so we have SCSI attached devices. These are more classical. This could be a SAS drive or a SCSI drive, it, it could, or, or a SATA drive, sorry. Um, it could be an SSD, it could be a spinning disk. Um, we have network attached stuff, so we have network block device. And then in the Linux kernel, we have a layer called the device mapper, which allows us to take multiple block devices, which don't have to be the same. They could be a mix of some of the ones I've shown you above. And you can do interesting things with them. You can raid them, so you can basically stripe data across them. And that, with hard drives, that sometimes got you better performance. You can do software-based raid. So the MD layer basically takes a bunch of drives, reserves some of them for the error correction parity, and then you know, using either an offload engine or just by doing the, the Reed Solomon calculations with the instruction set, it generates the parity. You, write, you get your data and you also get protection, and you can choose the level of protection. Now, maybe depending on your processor, not super performant, and you're probably giving up a lot of CPU cycles, but maybe you're using an offload engine, uh, uh, which is taking care of some of that for you. All right. Uh, and then applications can talk to these block devices, and there's standard ways for talking to them. We typically don't talk to them directly from an application layer. We typically put file systems on them because we like talking to files. But you can put, you can build your own file system, or you could be doing something. So you can certainly open a block device and read and write. At that point, you're reading and writing to specific LBA ranges rather than writing to files on a file system on a block device. But you could do it either way. Digging now into the physics or the physical thing of what is an NVMe device. I don't have a drive. I could have brought one with me so I could hold it up. But when you get down to real drives, the real drives that can actually store data, they ha typically have some form of attribute, right? So a, r a block device typically can be randomly accessed. I'm able to go to a specific point. We tend to call those logical block addresses and say, can you give me the data from logical block address 941, please? And it will do that. It will say, I will give you a logical block. How big is a logical block? Well, most, you know, I think pretty much any block device you can format, so you have some control over what that is, but typically the values that we see are things like 512 bytes, 1K, 4K, maybe 64K. So that's something that depends a little on the device and what you want to do with it, but you can't at that drive level say, I want one byte out of LBA 47, right? The drive doesn't know how to give you that. It can give you LBA 47, and the operating system can certainly chuck away the bits you don't want and give you the bits you do want, right? And that's what we use the page cache for quite a bit. But um, the drive itself has no way of giving you half of a sector 
operations have to be um, done on sectors. The other thing a block device typically gives you, which is one of the things that is challenging to us in the persistent memory world is atomicity, which is if I do something, I do it either in its entirety or I don't do it at all. So if I do a write of LBA 47 and the power disappears halfway through or something goes wrong, um, I don't expect to have what's called a torn sector. I expect that 47 has the old value before the write started or the other alternative is the write completes and the completion message is passed and I know then the new data is on that block. Right, and POSIX has lots of rules around, if, it's, if you want to be POSIX compliant, you have to follow certain rules on things like this, things like ordering and, and atomicity. And block devices try to do that. Persistent memory, because it's byte addressable, becomes much more challenging because you can now actually start to write half a sector and suddenly the power goes away and so you get half of one sector, uh, half the new data, half the old data, torn sector, very, very painful. The other thing is that a lot of block devices, not all of them, but certainly a lot of the block devices that I work with and care about has what's called a DMA engine, direct memory access engine. This is a piece of hardware on the drive that the driver ends up telling it what to do in terms of data movement. So with persistent memory, typically the way you get the data into and out of the persistent memory is using the load store instructions on the processor. Now, there's games that can be played there, but let's just assume that that's typically the way you would put data into something like an NVDIM N. The challenge with that is those, those loads and stores are being run on that expensive Xeon or ARM64 or whatever, and those instructions are consuming that core so it can't do something else. You're basically spending a lot of money to buy a core to move data around. And I think at some point in the history of computing, we realized that's not a very good way of spending CPU cycles. So we said, well, you know, there's actually a better thing to do here. Why don't we get the CPU to talk to some cheap thing that's in the system and say, hey, I'm busy. I'm busy doing FinTech or Bitcoin mining or artificial intelligence inference training. I want you to go do something. Can you go and move all the data that's at these physical addresses and put it somewhere for me, please? And reason interrupts so I know when you're done. And that's what DMA engines do. And in NVMe and SCSI and so forth, that's, that's typically the way they work. I like those because that means that my processor is now free to do my Bitcoin mining or render my Netflix so I can watch my movie or whatever. Uh, and, and in the meantime, the data is being moved by the DMA. So the way I think of that is kind of like a, a master and a slave or a butler and the rich upper class gentleman. So there's a British TV series, Jeeves and Wooster, based on a set of books. And uh, I think of uh, Jeeves as the DMA engine, the one doing all the work, and uh, Wooster as the CPU. Digging into it a little more, I spent quite a bit of time at a company called PMC, which was acquired by Microsemi. I was very involved in some of the flash controller business that we had there. So I'm pretty familiar with the internals of a block device. And I wanted to dig into that a little, just to give everybody a kind of level set on what and what, a, what does a block device look like? And this is, a, this is a pretty generic diagram of what you might find inside a non-volatile memory solid state drive, uh, basically an SSD, right? So if we look, um, it's hard to show here, but uh, if, you know, if we look at, for, for, at, at uh, I'm gonna get down over here. So over here, you can still hear me, I hope. So here's our host processor. Uh, we typically need some way of talking to our block device, right? So that, that could be something like PCIe, uh, it could be DDR even, this could be an NVDIM kind of block device. Uh, it could be SATA or SAS, right? Uh, but it's something that's coming out of the processor. Maybe one day this will be OpenGen CCIX, which is my name for the mismatch of protocols we have around memory-centric fabrics, but well, we'll see. Uh, and then you need a protocol to run on top of that electrical spec. So NVMe has become the standard way for PCIe to talk to, talk to drives over PCIe. We didn't always have NVMe. For a while, people were writing their own proprietary stuff uh, and doing their own fancy thing. Fusion IO had their own thing. You know, somebody else had their own thing. One of the great things that happened quite a few years ago is you know, a few different standards were working. There was SCSI Express and NVMe, and basically they fought in a, in a room until somebody came out. I think Jim Pappas like, hit somebody over the head. And we came out with a, a single kind of common standard. Yeah, see, so you're nodding your heads. That's actually what happened, right? Uh, and we have a, a standard over the top. This green box is a chip, like the micro semi chip, the flash tech chip. This doesn't have any memories on it, any storage on it. This is the chip 
that connects the host to the storage elements, right? Uh, and, and I'll dig into that in a second. It has to talk to the non-volatile memory. Flash is typically talked to using one of two protocols. There's Amphi and there's Toggle. And there's maybe some others, but those are the, the most popular ones. But this might not be NAND, right? This could be something else. So maybe we're talking to it using something like DDRT, which is a modified DDR with persistence in mind. Uh, maybe it's some other proprietary thing, right? It depends on what the memory vendors come up with. We typically have some DDR to store metadata. Doesn't, in consumer SSDs, we probably wouldn't want to pay for this, so that tends to go away. But in high performance SSDs, you often have this. And then within the chip, we typically have a bunch of hard-coded stuff that works very quickly that talks to the host, includes a DMA engine. We typically have some kind of processor, because trying to write RTL for all this and getting it right first time probably isn't going to work. So you're probably going to want to have firmware, and that's probably got to run on some instruction set. This probably isn't a 64-bit ARM with an MMU, but the way SSDs are going, maybe it is, right? In which case, it's, you know, it's full-on MMU Linux capable. I had an interesting conversation in the pub about some of this, but anyway, yeah, very, very interesting where certain things are going. Um, and this will do, you know, run the firmware. Uh, you, will, you will have some kind of error correction. I used to characterize NAND at PMC, and I would be horrified at how bad that stuff is. I can't believe we store data on SSDs. <laughs> but we actually use very sophisticated error correction. Andre talked about low density parity check codes. That's something that I worked on for quite some time earlier in my career. And they, they have to run very fast, right? Because this is running in line. So let's say I want to do a million IOPS here. That means at least a million IOPS has to go through here. And in fact, with write amplification, sometimes you need more than a million IOPS through here in order to service a million IOPS here, right? So these guys are really big uh, and very important. And then we have some generic interface uh, that converts uh, the bits to the wire, right? And that's, that's typically what a, what a block device looks like. Uh, a cer certainly a solid state one. So I want to, you know, maybe just start shifting gears a little bit and start looking at the latency component of the talk. So this is, you know, this is some, uh, someone once told me this, and, and I've always remembered this, throughput is easy, latency is hard, okay? I think of throughput as in, how do I get more cars from San Jose to San Francisco? If I want to get more cars per hour between those two different places, I can solve that problem. I can build a bigger highway. I can make it wider, and that means that more cars will be able to go from point A to point B in any given unit time. We have, uh, I, you know, Jeff, I see Jeff over here from Microsemi. We made a lot of money doing that same thing with hard drives. We saw that if you actually striped data across many hard drives, you connected them all together in parallel, you brought them in through an HBA or a RAID card, you could give someone a lot of throughput, like a lot of throughput, um, using pretty cheap hard drives and parallelism. That's great. Throughput is easy. I'm not gonna, you know, it's still work, but it's easy. Latency is hard. Latency is like asking the question, how do I get one car, one specific car, from San Jose to San Francisco faster than any other car has gone before? And that gets hard after a while, right? And eventually it gets impossible because that car is going at the speed of light. Right. You should see how I drive. <laughs> <laughs> right? And, and, you know, unfortunately, and we were talking a little about this at breakfast, but unfortunately, even people like Bezos, with all the money that they have, they are still also bound by the rules of physics. Even they can't move traffic between their data centers faster than the speed of light, as far as I know. <laughs> Now, maybe they're at the speed of light, but they're not going for faster. Right, I did wonder what would happen if you tried to do it, you know, where you did a, tried to do something and then tried to run away faster, you know, accelerate to the speed of light and then come back. But anyway, I, I, my brain started to hurt. But the, the, the thing here is throughput is easy and latency is hard. And the hard thing about latency is you don't get to subtract. If you go for latency, you've got to, you, know, you have multiple elements of how long your I.O. is going to take. Application has to issue it. You know, kernel has to accept it, has to pass through the virtual file system layer, has to go through the block layer, has to go into the driver, has to get pushed down to the drive. The drive has to service it. The drive either raises an interrupt or does something else. And then you basically have to go back, wake up the application. None of those values are negative because they're all time. You don't get a negative time. I don't get to subtract. I don't, I don't get to go, 
you know, submission queue entry took minus one second, right? It doesn't work that way. So latency always bites you in the ass because it's additive. Quick reminder on persistent memory, even though we're talking about block devices, persistent memory for me has three attributes. Low latency, memory semantics, i.e. it's not a block device, and storage features, the most important of which is persistence, because persistent memory without persistence is not persistent memory, it's just memory, right? Block devices, low latency block devices, like I'm now gonna really start digging into a lot, have two of the attributes, but they don't have all three, right? So we are moving away from the memory semantics here. Like I said, there's, there's good things and bad things about low latency block devices. So why do block? Why don't we just go to the world of persistent memory? Well, you know, I think we've already talked about the fact persistent memory still has some issues that we're working through. It's very exciting. Of course, the other challenge with persistent memory is I don't see a lot of persistent memory in the market that I can go buy today. There is some, and there's more than was a year ago, but we're still, you know, kind of early in our infancy there. Uh, on the block system, um, we can actually do pretty well with block. And I'm going to have some numbers in terms of how fast I can get data off some of these new block devices. And it's actually pretty good. And I want to compare to a couple of other uh, tests that I've done over, the, over the, the last little while. So this table here is interesting. This is basically saying I'm going to do I.O. tests on a couple of different block devices. The first one is the crazy, it's not actually a block device at all. It's just basically saying it's storing your data, but it doesn't. Uh, this one is actually an NVDIM N that was formatted to be a block device, so a PMEM0. And this is an NVMe drive. Um, so you can see that the average latency, this NVMe drive is not, the, I have other drives I'm going to be talking about in a little bit that have much better numbers than this, but just keep this in mind. So for a 512 byte access, you can see, even if I'm using an NVDIM, if I'm looking at it as a block device, I get pretty good latency, but I'm not 100 nanoseconds. Well, A, I'm talking 512 bytes, so it's not a, it's not a cache line access, it's multiple. All right. Uh, so three microseconds here, uh, and a 99 percentile of, of, of about six. Um, my drive is doing 12 and 18. Interestingly, it's better than this one. I, I suspect there might be a little bit of an experiment error there, because um, anyway, <laughs> maybe we'll go back and redo that and do it a little bit. If I ever had a master's student to give me that data, I'd probably slap them, saying, you probably need to run this for longer. But anyway. <laughs> But let's keep those numbers in our heads as we go through the rest of the talk. We're talking, you know, NVDIM as a block device, three microseconds. Uh, let's see how we can do with something else. Right, so I'm a very modest kind of guy. So when, I came up, <laughs> so when I came up with this, I called it the Bates conjecture. I'm sure somebody else has actually thought of this before. But um, this is something that I did the other day. The, I'm sorry the MATLAB here is quite jagged. I'm very happy to put this MATLAB online if anyone's interested and they can see exactly what I did and you'll actually realize why it's so jagged. But the Bates conjecture says that if somebody's coming to market with a new non-volatile memory, memory, so if somebody's a memory manufacturer and they're coming to market with it and they're saying, I need to get this into the market, I would argue it will come in as a block device before it comes in as a persistent memory per se. And the reason for that is that the error requirements that we need for this to be a reasonable memory technology are about 1 e to the minus 18, as in one time in 10 to the 18 reads or writes, or reads essentially, I, I'm allowed to have an error on my media. Right? That's a pretty big number. That's what we use in the storage industry. This is basically how often can I try to read the data from an SSD and the SSD can't give it to me but it can tell me it can't give it to me. There's another problem called false correction where I try to read from the drive and it gives me the data, but the data is not the right data. And that's called false correction and it has a much lower probability. And there's a man here who knows about error floors and LDPC codes. <laughs> I spend a lot of time worrying about those, these problems. But, so we actually need a very, very reliable media after the error correction, not before. So this is after the error correction. So we know we need 1e to the minus 18 afterwards, right? With block devices, I get to have very large block sizes for my code words, right? I'm accessing data in 4K chunks or 512 byte chunks. Those are quite big. So what I posed in my question was, assuming the code word size, the error correction code word size is a certain size, 
what raw bit error rate on the media do I have to have to hit 1e minus 18? And so what this says is, if you want to read and write your data at single byte levels, the media has to be better than 1e to the minus 10 in terms of its raw error rate. And that's hard. NAND, if you read 1,000 bits of NAND, even fresh NAND, like especially today, now we have TLC, even right at the start of life, there's probably five or six bits that are wrong, randomly distributed among that 100. Right? In the old days with SLC, it was much better than that. But there's a reason why you know, I've been in, kept in a job for a while. NAND is getting crappier because we don't want to pay for it. Right? <laughs> and an easy way of making cheap NAND is to make it crappy. And that's what we do. right? <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. So, so, so basically, as we say, well, let's not address in one byte, because I can't make my memory that reliable. Let's address in two bytes, or cache lines. Cache lines are 64-bit, right? That's eight bytes. Maybe 512 bytes, maybe 4K. And what happens is very quickly, the requirement of the raw media goes up, right? So now the process guys in the lab, the material scientists, are now getting happier, because you're not asking them to build you a memory that works at 1E minus 10. Maybe 1e minus 5. They're like, oh, that's actually maybe something we can do. Uh, and as we get up here to the kind of sizes that NAND is using, it actually lines up to what NAND is. Well, surprise, surprise, right? It's an, <laughs> you know, it's, we're looking at 1 in 100, 1 in 1,000 error rate. It's kind of where the SSDs live. SpinTorque MRAM is very reliable. SpinTorque MRAM is trying to be down here. Everspin guys will say it's here. My measurements say, <laughs> you know, but you know it's pretty good, right? SpinTorque MRAM lives in this world. 3D Crosspoint, you know, I honestly don't know exactly what it is, but I'm glad, I'm going to put a serious wager. It's in here somewhere. It's not as good as SpinTorque. It's better than NAND, right? NAND is up here, right? This is this is information theory. This is like the speed of light. You don't get to break this crap. There's a guy called Claude Shannon. He's awesome. He's not live anymore, but he's awesome. And there's very, very fundamental mathematics about why that curve cannot be violated. Okay? And I call it Bates conjecture. Do I get to call it the Bates conjecture, Andrew? <laughs> so what it means is if you want to be byte addressable, you need very reliable media. When materials are brought into the market, they typically start, tend to start crappy. And as the processes are tuned, the yields get better things get better, right? You can turn the knobs and so forth. So the first materials coming off the line may not be good enough for byte addressability. And maybe it's better to put them in a block interface, put them behind an NVMe front end. Who do we know? Which company do we know that came out with a, a memory that was going to be byte addressable, and now we see it in NVMe drives that may or may not be called Optane? <laughs> No, I'm not saying that's the only reason they did it, but let's, let's, uh, I wouldn't surprise me if this is maybe part of the story. The Bates conjecture. Uh, I have a quick question. Why is the requirement so very different? Like eight orders of magnitude? Yeah, so it's the mathematics. It's basically large number theory. So the question was, why does it grow so rapidly? And like I said, I can provide, if you like, the MATLAB to do it. It's pretty straightforward. But basically, it's assuming we're using BCH codes with a certain fixed code rate. So I'm not allowed to change the code rate. And I know the output error rate has to be 1e minus 18, which means if you have a small code word size, the chances of having one bit wrong in 10 bits is a certain thing. The probability of having 10 bits wrong in 100 bits is much less than one bit wrong in 10 bits for the same input error rate. It's kind of like flipping die. So it's kind of tail the curve. I think it's called the large number theory, and, and it falls out of that. But it's pretty straightforward. And what happens is, as the block size gets big, pretty soon you get to a point of diminishing returns. And you actually saw that, like going from one kilobyte to four kilobytes doesn't buy you that much. But certainly going from 10 bits to 100 bits buys you a huge amount. Yeah. So let's keep moving. I'm going to be terrible again, aren't I? Oh, God. Uh, so low latency block devices are here. They are here. You can go get them. You can talk to my friend Terry here. Uh, they have the NV Nitro card, uses SpinTorque MRAM to back the data. Microsemi, we had an NV RAM card. It's an NVMe device with DRAM, and it uses a SuperCAT to store the data on power loss. We have Intel's Optane, now to be called Bates Conjecture Drives. Right? Uh, <laughs> interestingly, all these devices are NVM Express to the host, every single one of them. Now, that's interesting. Um, Really, you know, essentially because 
many reasons we've talked about that the, the NVMe came along because SCSI wasn't quite doing what we wanted for non-volatile memory. Um, and in the same way for low latency, uh, SCSI has some issues and you definitely want to go NVMe. And I think also we're on very much now the path that pretty much anything that's non-volatile memory based is probably going to be PCIe attached, which means it's NVMe. Right. There are probably a few exceptions to that, but we'll, we'll see. They are pretty freaking fast. So this is some FIO measurements off the NV Nitro card that the Everspin guys were very kind to lend me or let me have. This was FIO, right? This is not SPDK. Am I allowed to swear? I'll get to that in a second. This was in the standard kernel, and we basically just ran FIO testing. And basically, we looked at different block sizes, 512 bytes, sub 5 microseconds. This is pretty fast. This is not too different to the PMEM0 device, remember, three and a half. That's not that bad, right? Here, here, and you know, here, here we're not, you know, here we're getting more limited by what's my DMA capabilities. This is the ones that are kind of most interesting. So five microseconds, that's pretty good. This is QDEPT1, which some people argue is not a very interesting workload. But it is a very good way of testing the response time of the SSD. Also, pretty good quality of service. So this is a different device. But what I did here, and it's a little slower, but what I did here is I did like millions of reads. And then I plotted the probability density function of the reads. So some reads take 7.5 microseconds. Some reads take 10. They have some kind of distribution. It looks kind of Gaussian. Ah, large number theory, central limit theory here. Also, lots of math in this talk. Um, notice you know, it's quite tight, right? Not, not, no I.O. less than a certain amount. Certainly no I.O. less than zero. That would be an anti-causal SSD. I have a patent on that. <laughs> I'm going to be very rich. <laughs> Whoever builds an anti-causal SSD is going to be very rich. <laughs> and uh, not a lot of I.O. out here, right? Hyperscalers, data centers, they hate heavy tails. The whole NVMe this year has all been about how do I, as the owner of an NVMe drive, control what this looks like under my workload patterns. That's it. That's what, that's what IO determinism is. That's what open channel is. The end result, what we're looking for, those that, you know, IO determinism and open channel are the mechanisms. But the thing we're actually trying to do is have the consumer be able to control what that curve looks like. Whether we can get there or not, I don't know. Another one. This is from an Intel Optane. Um, same idea. Did lots of I.O. This is, sorry, is in nanoseconds, so divide by a 1,000. Honestly, it's not milliseconds. <laughs> That'd be bad. So again, very tightly binded, good quality of service. Some pretty funky stuff going on inside that Optane drive. I haven't had time to go work out exactly, but there's something funny. A little bit of a funny little thing. And that was actually, I had a couple of drives and they all did it. So it's like, whoa, I don't know. You're doing something funky in your controller. But uh, anyway. But again, pretty fast and so forth. I'm going to skip through this because um, I think we're running out of time pretty drastically. How am I doing for time? Anyone? If she's not on the sign, you're good. Yeah, that's a good sign. Um, we'll run through this a little bit. I was going to step through what an NVMe command looks like. I personally love doing that. I love putting the PCIe analyzer between the host and the drive and looking at what exactly happens. I'm a very sad gentleman. Uh, so that's a, a picture of an NVMe read command, but we'll get into it. OK, I, I do have to raise the, the cat or the, the dark horse in the room and talk about SPD fucking K. I'm going to actually swear. <laughs> So this is the this is the name that my this is the name that myself and Sagi came up with when we were very drunk one night, uh, bemoaning bemoaning user space drivers. So that said, that said, that said, I may you know I I, I no I, I yeah that said I, I think there's good things about it, but I, I kind of like teasing people, so I keep the fucking in there. So SPDK for those who don't know is a user space tool that basically says to the kernel, screw you, do not get involved with this PCIe device. I'm taking it. You can't touch it. You can't manage it. You're not going to look after it and do all the things that sensible operating systems do, like make sure you don't DMA to random locations, et cetera. I'm going to bind to that memory map region from user space, and I'm going to have a great time. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> Why would you do that? A, you're insane. B, 
in theory, well, in, you, know, you are actually bypassing the kernel and the lines of code in there around the virtual file system and so forth. And, and so that can help reduce latency. Right? Now, we're trying to make the Linux kernel block layer, the fast path, the, the, the data path, as low as possible in terms of lines of code. Right? So it's not really fair to say the kernel's got like 10 million lines of code. Those 10 million lines of code don't have to execute for every single I.O. Right? It's, you know, we, we have ways of streamlining things and so forth. So, so that's a little unfair. And then the other thing is context switching. So often an application, well not often, sometimes an application calls via a read command that says, let's read from this drive. Okay? That typically invokes a context switch because we're going through a system call that's a blocking call and it involves basically flushing TLBs, changing the virtual address map, and whatever. But you don't have to do it that way. We have asynchronous I.O. We have lib AIO. You can have a thread that's running and say, hey, do all these I.O., and I'll come and check later on my completion queue to see if it's done. There is, you know, basically in a multi-core system, what happens is another core takes care of the I.O., all right? A kernel running core. Uh, uh, thank you, perfect. So it, there is no context switch there. The, the, th the process, the application that's running continues to run, right? It issues the I.O. by telling another thread running on another hardware core to go do the I.O., right? So you know, the context switch thing, I get, yes, but things can be done there, right? The, the real problem, I think, I, I, so to be fair, SPDK, certainly in my measurements, is faster, and quite a bit. So this is the Optane drive. This is the PDF from the FIO testing. This is the PDF with SPDK testing. All right, there's definitely some number of microseconds, and you know, to be honest, you, know, you could probably spend months digging into exactly what's going on, blah, 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 I didn't do that, but there's definitely some changes there. Right? Interestingly, the distribution also looks a little bit different. We'll get into that. And again, I probably should have gathered more data, et cetera, but I just kind of wanted to make a little bit of a point. The problem is you have taken that block device and you've given it to user space. So anything that's between in the kernel is lost to you. File systems, no, no. Build your own user space file system. Kernel can't give you one. You're bypassing the kernel. Block trace, block trace is pretty darn good when things are going freaky, right? It's a lot of debug tools, a lot of capability, a lot of performance analysis tools live there. You lose that. No IO stat. Right? I can't just run IO stat. I can't just run FIO. There is an FIO plugin, but it's a little painful. But I can't just run FIO. I can't run NVMe CLI. Ah! Oh. Right? Because the NVMe CLI talks to the character devices that are given by the kernel, and they don't exist anymore because you're bypassing the kernel. You can't run NVMe CLI, but it's so good. Yeah, you turned it on. What's that? You've turned it on. Thank you. <laughs> so you can. But people have to do work to do that, and that work. So you know, again, we can get in the pub, and you can buy me beer, and we can argue about this. Um, <laughs> anyway, so what is, you know, why is that? Why is the kernel um, not so good? And I'm going to move, start moving along much further. I think Martin said it yesterday much better than I did. Martin maintains a section of, of the storage stack of the Linux kernel. And we have to be all thing, you know, we have to be more kind of inclusive uh, and more um, conservative in the things that we pull into the upstream kernel. Because we are in all kinds of places as Linux, and we are servicing many, many different people many, with many, many different sets of requirements. And making changes that are specific for data center or enterprise is not the way that the Linux upstream effort should go. It has to provide some kind of common value, right? So SPDK doesn't take that approach. SPDK is Intel going, best frickin' networking and storage ever, right? In, in, a, in, a, in a server that's probably an Intel server, right? So, so their requirements are very, very different. Right? But the question then becomes, so what can we do? Okay, and I'm gonna really move very quickly now. Polling, we've added polling to the block layer. Martin talked about it a little bit less yesterday. Polling on these kind of bad devices does definitely help. So one of the drives I had, I was doing 9.1 microseconds with no polling. Uh, and then I could get that down to 7.4. That was one of the microsemi devices. It pulls in the quality of service. You pay a price. If you're polling, the CPU that is looking for the completion is going, have you finished it? Have you finished it? And it's like, and this is like my son. Have you finished it? Have you finished it? Have you finished it? Have you finished it? Dad, 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 what the? <laughs> okay, so uh, we added polling. You can turn it on um, uh, and have some control on it. 
we immediately, immediately realized polling from time zero is kind of crazy. It's like, you know, it's like putting, uh, expecting any device to, to, to service the I.O. in zero time is crazy. So we thought, well, that, then let's wait some time to pull. Well, how long should we wait? Well, we started going, well, let's actually measure completion times. So we added some code to measure completion times in the stats, uh, a new stats structure. Uh, and we now set polling at half the completion time. So you can basically do no polling at all, minimum CPU utilization, uh, but the longest latency. You can poll all the time, or you can poll half the time. And in this case, polling half the time, we didn't lose a single I.O. In fact, you know, the, the 7.3 and 7.4 is probably noise in the measurements. So basically, it, there was absolutely no loss in polling half the time, because all the I.O. is completed in three quarters of the time, or whatever, right? And that was added in 4.10. Um, we now have the ability, this is, this is kind of interesting, I won't go into the results so much, but it's kind of interesting. We now have the ability that an application can now say on a per I.O. basis if it's important or not. So we can actually tell, that an application can tell the kernel if it would like a certain I.O. to be treated with higher priority than another I.O. And that's really just gone in. Um, the, it's in the kernel for a while. This man here added most of the ties to the system call. The glibc, the libraries, the user space library wrappers that go around the read command and so forth. I don't know, are they in? Like, so I just now that you brought it up, I thought I saw it on the mailing list and I'm just doing a git pull on glibc to confirm it. Thank you very much. They're the joys of open source. <laughs> um, even without it being in glibc, if you know how to write a system call wrapper, it's very easy to get tied into this. But what it means is I can issue a whole bunch of I.O. and I can say this one is important, this one isn't. This one is important, this one isn't. Anyone in the room find that interesting? I would think so, right? You know, these I.O. are important. So this triggers the polling? What's that? This triggers the polling? It, it, well, it, it tells the kernel it's important. Right now it triggers polling. In the future it may do a different thing. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, it's in glibc now. Perfect, great. Um, we also, uh, I'm gonna skip this, but we did also realize that rather than just looking at a single I.O. Um, size, like averaged over all I.O., we actually wanna bin by I.O. size. So we're getting more sophisticated there. And um, I'll, I'll skip this for the sake of the conversation. Um, you know, the, there's basically there's a lot of people taking a look at this and saying, what else can we add now that we've got all of these things in, what else can we do? Uh, and it's open source, so if anybody else has ideas they wanna contribute, please come along. It's, it's very easy to get involved. You will occasionally get flamed by Christoph or whatever. <laughs> but that's all part of the fun. So what's coming next? That distribution curve, those PDFs, the probability density functions, that for me is like what the heck we're spending a lot of time on right now. And getting user space or application space control of that is kind of where we got to go. All right, so how do we let applications send hints or signals down into the kernel around how important certain I.O. are, which ones are low latency and which ones are not. So we're starting to do that. We have things like streams, also known as directives, I.O. determinism, there's been a lot of talk around that. I.O. priority, how do we make sure certain I.O. are important. Uh, I.O. expected lifetime, which is something that uh, Martin talked about. And then we have even more interesting extreme things where we open up the SSDs even more to the outside world, like open channel, which uh, I see Mateus is here and I think Laura might be around. Um, lots of interesting work for that. And the Linux kernel is gonna keep evolving. And, and you know, the last thing I, I think I'll say is like, the Linux kernel has been worked on by some of the best coders in the planet. And I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about you know, the people who are actually doing the real work. Um, and having those people putting in the features that make your storage systems more responsive or better tuned to applications. I mean, you get to benefit from all that work, right? And, and if, if um, um, you know, and if uh, it, it, we will continue to evolve as these devices become more popular and cheaper and higher capacity, and the kernel will allow you to tune for them for, for your workloads. So I'll stop there, just so we have a couple of minutes, because I got into so much trouble last time. And save Mark having to beat me. Uh, good just, job. Just a quick thank you to Intel for giving me access to the Optanes, even yep. though I slag off there. <laughs> so who has a question for Stephen? No. Everyone's in shock. You finished early so they could yeah, yeah, ask you yeah, questions, yeah. and then they're yeah, not coming yeah. through. There you go. I got one. All right. So uh, if you look at the the, the fit of a memory system, the, the failures in time, 
of a memory system. It seems like to me that 1E minus 11 is not good enough, mm -hmm. especially like for the, the RAID controllers you worked on, that type thing. Yep. So you just describe why that is good enough? For, so the, the question was around the failure error rate. Um, so 1E minus 18 is the industry standard for an individual drive. So if you put a drive in your system for the drive, for the return error rates. Right? So I w the 1E minus 11 number was before the error correction, remember? So 1E minus 11 on the media, assuming that there's some kind of Hamming code that's able to fix the errors to get it to 1E minus 18. Now you could redraw that curve, assuming your target error rate is 1E minus 22, if you like, and that'll get you a, a different curve. It'll have the same kind of shape, but it will be moved to the left or to the right. Yeah. I think the concern I have is that even 1E minus 18 as a memory system failure yeah. rate yeah. is not sufficient for many systems. Yeah, so, that, so I think it's a good point. Like, I, I would agree, tend to agree with you, Terry. If, if we are using m persistent memory as memory, like, as in it's storing our stack, it's storing the heap, and it's not a block device, which is kind of storing the story, it's like not on a file system, then the error rates probably need to be lower again than the numbers I've talked about here. Because now you're not talking about an I.O. failure, you're talking about a crash on the stack. And that is a very, very different thing, right? Any other questions? All right. Oh, one last question, and then we have to be on a break. Thank you, Arn. Wondering if, uh, well, where do we stand with the gap between SPDK and kernel with this latest low latency work? Yeah, that, so I think the gap is still probably around the microsecond mark for the devices that I've looked at. But like I said, I, I think there is an exercise that needs to be done by, you know, to really dig into exactly what is going on there. And I, I certainly haven't had time to do it, and maybe other people can comment on what they say. Yeah, so, so, yeah, blatant plug. If you want to learn more about that, you can go to Christoph's talk, which I think is this afternoon. He's still working on the slides, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've had the anti Intel keynote, and <laughs> next up I we have Intel. <laughs> the Intel keynote, but after a short break. So please uh, come back at 10.40 uh, for the Intel keynote. I'm thanking them for their drive. I love you, Intel. I love you. <laughs>